Great. People are streaming in. Um, hi, hello. Um, it is a wonderful time of the year to get together with all of you. I am Paulita Bennett Martin. I'm the Senior Strategist for Policy Initiatives at the Five Gyres Institute. And today I'm being joined by a wonderful panel of esteemed scientists from across the world. And we're here to talk about the Global Plastics Treaty. So I don't wanna waste time. I'd like to jump right into these conversations by setting the stage about what the Global Plastics Treaty is. But if you would also be so kind as to drop in the chat where you are um, in the chat, yeah, um, please let us know where you're calling in from. Um, let us know if you're with an organization, whatever, we'd love introductions. But I'm gonna go ahead and get us started off on the Global Plastics Treaty. Um, in fact, what I'm gonna do is give you the lay of the land on treaties in general, a very, very quick high level. This could take hours and a whole semester to go over. So what is a treaty and what goes into a treaty? There are some key steps that you should know exist within the process of a, of a treaty. And so in general, there's going to be some sort of resolution that gets introduced. Um, the, the intergovernmental negotiating committee will be the one that actually enters negotiations. Um, and that is a process where there will be opportunities for observers to go and, and to be support and provide information. Um, there's a finalization after those negotiation processes go through. Approval, um, that's the process of obtaining the necessary approval for the treaty, right? Um, there's the act of signing the treaty. And so uh, signing of a treaty is generally, you know, head, head of state. Um, in some places, there's slight tweaks, and I'll get to that. Um, and then there's a ratification process, right? So once we've decided this is the treaty, um, that we're going to go with, then there's ratification. That means that the countries step up and that decision maker decides to ratify the treaty or become party to that. And then there's entry into force. So that's when the date of the treaty becomes binding and enforceable. Who are the key players? Um, that's pretty much very similar across all nations. Here in the United States, it's the president who negotiates treaties, but truly that means that his cabinet is largely looking at treaties. Um, the Senate, our, our US Senate, is who approves the treaty. So they're the one that is very involved in that ratification process before the president would actually ratify to become a party to this instrument. So that changes though, I mean, to give, I don't know how many of you are here in the US on this call and how many are across the world. So to honor that, we'll look at a couple of other places. Um, in Rwanda, the constitution grants the president also the power to ratify treaties on behalf of the country. Um, and then the parliament also reviews any sort of treaty that the president would ratify. In a nation like Belize, it's actually the national assembly that ratifies a treaty. So you've got slight tweaks, but in general, what you're looking at is the body, your legislative body, plus your head of state that are involved in that process of making the final decision. Um, so that's kind of the general for the international practice. Now, let's dive deeper into the Global Plastics Treaty. So this started, um, the first official step in this process was the introduction of a resolution um, to the United Nations Environmental Assembly. This is the end plastic pollution towards an internationally legal, legally binding instrument. That's the name of the resolution. We've probably heard of resolutions in multiple ways. And they're often used as a first step to flag some sort of um, binding law that we want to create. And that goes, that goes for local, state, national, and international policy. What the resolution for the Global Plastics Treaty does is it highlights the need for sustainable production and consumption. It calls for environment, environmentally sound waste management. It promotes efficient use of resources, encourages circular economy approaches, and aims to create legally binding agreement by 2040. So who was essential to the um, early, or I would say, or early contributors to the resolution? 
um, some nations such as Peru, Rwanda, Japan, um, and then there were key supporting entities in this early phase as well, such as the Business Coalition for a Global Plastics Treaty, which is steered by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Wildlife Fund. You also have the High Ambition Coalition, which is co-chaired by Norway and Rwanda. So those are some of the entities that were involved throughout the very early stages of this process. Now, as we move forward, it's 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 a lengthy, treaties are always a lengthy process from, from the, the very start of the resolution all the way to implementing. And so between November, 2022 and November, 2024, there have been um, five intergovernmental negotiating committees, um, also known as the INC, that's when we throw that term around there. Um, and, there's an anticipated timeline that the treaty will be signed, a treaty will be signed in 2025. Um, once the signing of the treaty occurs, again, the nations must ratify this treaty. For lack of better words, this is when they agree to become a party to, to this agreement, this international and legally binding agreement. So most recently, INC5 occurred in Busan, and ended without agreement. However, the committee has opened the door to an additional INC in 2025. The INC chair um, also has a paper that's been circulated and um, edited multiple times. I believe now we're on the third draft of this paper. Um, it went through two iterations at INC5. And it continues to be a problematic statement in terms of process, transparency, accuracy. Um, however, the nations that are at the table have agreed to use this as, as a steering document, um, but also agreeing that it's not necessarily the basis for what the treaty will be, right? So what we're looking forward to now is this opportunity for an additional, a new, um, INC6 or whatever they might call it. It might be an INC 5.2, uh, but the opportunity remains um, there. And so it's an interesting time to be involved and to be getting updates on the treaty and to also hear about how scientists are stepping in and playing a critical role uh, because what you have in the treaty process is, is largely nations and government um, you know, heads of states and their cabinets who are involved in this process. And then you have lobbyists and you have big industry, um, such as the petrochemical industry, the plastics industry, and all of their people that are there having their voices heard. And then you have the advocacy community as well, um, activists, um, civil society organizations. However, there's also the scientists. And where are is their role? Um, and what are they bringing to the table? And what does their science tell us we need in a global plastics treaty? That's what we're here to learn about today. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Ertl, to take over this conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Paulita, for that really important context setting. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking about the science, how it's helping inform a global plastics treaty. I'm Dr. Lisa Ertl, the Director of Science at Five Gyres, and I'm thrilled to be with um, three extraordinary scientists and friends. Um, Dr. Marcus Erickson, co-founder and researcher at Five Gyres. Uh, Patty Villarubia Gomez, joining us from Spain, um, who is a PhD candidate at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And Dr. Bethany Carney Almrith, the Professor of Ecotoxicology at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Thank you all for being here. Um, but before we dive in, I just wanted to set the stage. We're all just back from the most recent negotiations at INC5 in Busan, um, but we saw some significant hurdles there. We, we thought we may be coming out of the meeting with the treaty, but we're still not there yet. So even though, um, uh, we we had had potentially hoped that we'd come come out with something. There were clearly nations with very diverse priorities and some challenges. Um, things from obstructionist tactics to lack of consensus, and there remains a need, like Polly just said, to go back uh, in 2025 for an INC 52 or an INC 6. But despite not getting to a treaty yet. Um, 
I think scientists have really made our voices clear. The Scientists Coalition for an Effective Plastics Treaty is now over 1,000 scientists strong around the world. And with over 70 scientists on the ground last week in Busan, um, we were there really to, to center the science, making sure that decision makers are armed with the right studies so the, these decisions can really be based on facts. And we stepped in where we could, but it still remains to be seen how much science will make it into the final version of the treaty. So with that context in mind, I wanted to turn to our panelists um, here about perspectives um, on the ground so far and what is still to come. So um, I wanted to first point to understanding the Scientist Coalition. So Bethany and Patty, this one's for you as founding members and being on the ground since INC1. The Scientist Coalition has been pivotal in supporting member states. Could you walk through how this support works and why it's so essential on the ground? Yeah, really quick rundown of our history. So, so the resolution that Polita spoke about was a decision that was made in March of 2022 at UNEA 5.2. And we were super happy to see that that resolution was adopted. It sort of shifted the story from a marine plastic pollution problem which was, of course, building on the science from that field to a much broader understanding of plastics through the life cycle. So the scientific community was like really happy to see this, this shift in framing of the problem and understanding of the problem. But the resolution didn't contain anything uh, indicating uh, how science would be feeding into the process to ensure evidence-based decision-making. So a number of us wrote a letter to the INC Secretariat and to Ingrid Andersson, who's head of UNEF, asking a question about this and just pointing to the the fact that we saw a need there. They um, they agreed with us and we started some initial dialogues and, and also within the scientific community, we're pulling together a group of scientists that had signed the scientist declaration, um, which was in support of this uh, resolution, 514, and decided to go to Uruguay for the first meeting to uh, to bring to try to bring the science into the space. And there we had some uh, sort of informal discussions between the scientists that were on the ground there and UNEP and the INC secretariat. But we also saw a real need for what we could bring to the room. So we had started talking with, with delegates and realizing that some countries come to these meetings very strong, like the US has tens or dozens of, of people that are coming and they have chemists and they have oceanographers and they have lawyers and they have everything that you would need to talk about plastics. And then you have other delegates that are coming from other countries that have one or two or three people that maybe are working on a lot of different uh, negotiations or cops and are not plastics experts and don't have or didn't have at least the knowledge that they might have needed to be able to negotiate um, strongly in this space. And uh, we had that first week an Ask a Scientist event that we pulled together uh, inviting just delegates to come into the room with us and ask questions and just sort of have an informal mingle and started documenting the needs of the delegates, like what kind of science do they need? What can we bring to them? And that's when we started uh, building the coalition, which we've spent the past two and a half years building into this uh, amazing organization that it is today, but also understanding uh, how we could input science. So some of that is fact sheets, just like plastics 101, basic, uh, what's a polymer, what's a, what, what does the word um, biodegradable mean, like these sorts of introductory uh, documents. And then we also started pulling it together, uh, policy briefs, which were summarizing how the science could feed into the policy discussions um, and trying to be like responsive and reactive to the needs of the delegates as the treaty discussions progressed. So yeah, pulling on the scientific community to create these documents. Um, we have all procedures for all of this, but I think it's been uh, very well received. And maybe follow up for, for Patty. Um, now, go moving from something that is um, responsive and reactive to also something a bit more proactive um, and making sure that those resources are available to, to people in the in between the INCs. Um, do you, do you feel like the science is is breaking through and, and how is the scientist coalition navigating that? Well, I think that it's absolutely uh, the science is break, breaking through. Like also we have to remind, of course, that we are not the only scientists in the room. Uh, there, are, there are many other. We are the ones that came up as a coalition of like 
many different researchers from all over the world. And I think that one of our strongest points, just adding to what Bethany just said, is that it's not that we are a very interdisciplinary group of scientists, is that we also come from different backgrounds and different countries and we speak many different languages. And I think that uh, very often I, I see that it's forgotten that these uh, spaces are all Anglophone. And as just Bethany said, um, there are delegations that bring one, two, or three persons, and maybe not all of them speak English. Many of them are Francophone, as it's the case for many Francophone countries in, in Africa or Latin American countries. So I think that we bring the science and we bring the science translated into many different languages. Always try to do English, Spanish, French, and sometimes it's even Turkish because we have people from Turkey or uh, I think that we have a few in Arabic as well. So like, I think that science is breaking through and is breaking through in a way that has not done it as far as we are hearing in other, in other treaties. Um, yeah. I think it's so amazing. And Marcus, I wanted just to point to you because we, as Patty pointed out, I mean, there are so many different backgrounds, languages and countries and Curious your thoughts ab about how much this has grown over the last 15 years. Uh, obviously, the field has grown tremendously from when you were leading some of the early five gyres expeditions. And it's gone from, like Patty said, or like Bethany said, uh, from really a solely focused marine issue to something that's much more comprehensive. Um, so why, you know, why why now and, and why this international treaty and not just a reliance on international laws? What is the science tell us about the need for something that is that is binding and international. Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, I, I've been at this for almost 20 years. And to see the issue grow from being an ocean plastics focus, you know, even, even back then, my mentor, Captain Charles Moore, who identified the grapes of a garbage patch, we would talk, you know, candidly about it's not just oceans, it's everything else. But that's what took the world by storm. That was what the media kind of gravitated toward these fictional islands of trash in the oceans. And we sort of ran with that narrative. But it's always been, you know, there's a much, much bigger picture. And I think you know, it wasn't until the issue was on everyone's doorstep. The amount of plaster produced, things, what, 10 billion tons since the 1950s has been made. It's inescapable. It's not just on our beaches. It's on. It's literally on your doorstep. It's. It's. You look in the mirror and it's on you. It's in your body. So I think... It's it's the culmination of awareness um, and the science is there. I think that's what's, what's driven the world, I think, to say, okay, enough is enough. And two years ago, to, to decide we need a treaty. Um, but it's interesting, you know, having been there with you, Lisa and Bethany and, 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 and Patty, this is, this is my second INC, INC four and five, just seeing how the process works and the interplay between you know, science and policy and what the delegates know and don't know. And this is something that Bethany and Patricia just touched on. And you got some delegates that this is not their focus. There are maybe one, two or three people. I met, you know, only one representative from Haiti that had an arduous task, an arduous trip to get to INC5 and just wanted to know some of the science. Um, so I saw some, some disconnects, um, things that, you know, delegates need to know at the role of the Scientist Coalition. And then also, I think, some of the, the media storytelling about this INC5, some disconnects there. So I was going to talk about those two things real quick, just to put some questions out there. Having been back for less than a week now, seeing the media portray INC5 as, oh, the treaty's a failure, no agreement was reached, things have been derailed, it's just baloney. It's bull. I mean, we watched a coalition of the willing come to the table to see the, the delegates from Rwanda and Panama to speak up. It was powerful. It sort of rocked me to my core to hear some such powerful statements. So I think that the world is in a much stronger position. The high ambition coalition knows the task ahead and they know, you know, what the 
the low ambition, the like-minded countries are what they're really up to. But there is this very strong coalition. There was a press conference in the middle of INC5 that was powerful. So I, I want people to know, you know, our audience who's listened to this webinar, that uh, you know, whatever you hear in the media about the outcome of INC5, there is a much bigger and more powerful, you know, story that uh, should be told. And one of the that's that's the disconnect between media and the public. The other was one thing I noticed a few times talking to a few delegates um, was about human health. You know, having met you know a lot of really good scientists in the Scientist Coalition. Um, about where we are with human health. We know enough to act. Precautionary principle applies big time. There's enough evidence out there. But a lot of delegates were saying, oh, until there's enough, enough knowledge about human health, we can't really act. And also some saying, you know, there's evidence of observation of microplastics in our bodies, in a placenta, in, in the human arterial plaque, even getting into our, our brains, that it's observed, but it's not harmful. So I, I'd, I'd love to hear some, you know, maybe Patty and Bethany, uh, yes, could, could could maybe comment on on the human health that we know enough to act, that there is harm, and about that disconnect between media communications um, about what we saw at the treaty and what story we should be telling. Yeah, Bethany. I have like, I have so many things to say, but I'll try to keep it uh, brief so we can address a lot of questions. So 100%, and that's some of what you're referring to, Marcus, is this this shift that we've been uh, seeing that I, that I referred to a little bit in moving away from marine plastics to this broader understanding of the pollution problem. And the health aspect of it is definitely one of those issues. So science has been emerging, but not only the science itself, but the narrative, as you pointed to, like this, the ocean gyres to this pervasive um, problem around plastics, which is contaminating literally the entire planet right now. So in the at the first INC one, I think some of the some some of the, there are a very small number of scientists uh, that were there. I think there was like five from our group and maybe a total of twenty that we were able to find. There there might have been others that were at the at the space did put some uh, time and effort into talking about chemicals. So chemicals and plastics that plastics are not just inert materials, but that they're complex materials that contain thousands of chemicals and more data has since emerged um, after that meeting. So putting that conversation onto the table and then bringing the conversation around, I don't know if you hear background noise, I'm in my kitchen right now, bringing the, the health aspects into it. And that is an emerging science. And that's where science communication becomes so important and doing that in, in a good way. So, so communicating as you pointed to the precautionary principle, even when there is early evidence, but maybe not um, as strong evidence that we see from other, other sectors. But one of the things that we're up against and that you've been inferring a little bit is the, is the, the pushback around these questions. And there are, um, there are groups of countries and uh, industries and others that are participating in these meetings that do have other agendas, uh, if I put it um, nicely like that, that are and, and we have witnessed um, a spread of misinformation and disinformation and um, sort of a, a perversion and kidnapping of scientific uncertainty to to cause delay and to block policy action. And these are tactics that have been employed by industry, I would say, and other actors with conflicts of interest or vested economic interests to try to to block and delay policy action. So ways to undermine science, ways to undermine um, the understanding of science and what it tells us about the threats and, and just really understanding the problem for what it is. Uh, I can stop there and let Patty jump in. I see her hand came up and I'm sure I'll have more things to yeah, say. Yeah, and I, I saw Patty nodding vigorously, especially around <laughs> myths and disinformation. And I'm really curious, Patty, like what some of your thoughts are like in scientists' responsibility to combat that, can we just put out our science and let it speak for itself? So I, if, if you don't mind, I would just like to add in into what Bethany and Marcus uh, mentioned before um, uh, in, in relation also to how much some of the delegates may or may not know. And I think that it's also important to remember that not all delegates come into these treaties, regardless the treaty it is, is not only about plastics, but plastic is the newest one. The same delegates in, ma in many cases are the same ones going from climate COP to biodiversity COP to the treaty, to the plastics treaty. So maybe these delegates are very knowledgeable about 
another uh, environmental problem, but this specific plastic one is actually something quite new into the narrative in our society from the point of view of plastics is more than marine litter or plastics is are more than waste. So that I, I think that is also a representation of what is happening in social media or mass media. And, and it's even many scientists not being totally convinced yet that plastics is more than waste. What Bethany is saying, like the chemical and the human health aspect is it's super important. And, and I would say that we are having some issues on attacks on science and attack on scientists and how mis this mis and disinformation are happening and, and absolutely so for plastics because as most of you may know by now, um, but I remind reminded like 99% of plastics come from fossil fuels in one way or, an or another, either by uh, the, the monomers, but also the the additives, the chemicals that are in plastic com comes also from fossil fuels, right? So that is something that is not yet very much like widespread on news. And there are some journalists that they, they do follow that narrative, like seeing plastics from a bigger, uh, a bigger and broader uh, and plastics and chem within like including chemicals. Um, but it's still something that sometimes is hard to convey because of the complexity of the issue. And I think that that is also what happens with negotiators, that it's quite difficult to understand for many, like the pervasiveness and toxicity of chemicals mm -hmm. and how complex it is. And, and to your question, Lisa, sorry, do we have to combat that? Yes. 100%, but I think that we are still in need of finding the sweet spot on not overburdening ourselves to answer every single question and trying to uh, teach every denier and, and try to do it in a, in a, in a like a smartest way. And, and I think that maybe you are professionals on communications as well, so that would be great to, to hear from you, for instance, like Marcus. At some point, it becomes a bit of whack-a-mole, and and you can be wasting too much of your time to combat that mis and disinformation. And in some ways, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it could be done in a way to distract from the real science work that we do. Marcus. So, so Patty, you 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 said something about you know delegates come to this the treaty negotiations. They Maybe they're working on climate, uh, another cop, they're coming from that, working on biodiversity. Now they can work on plastics and they might, and they're not experts because they're doing everything. What I thought you were going to mention when you began that, that conversation was people who work in those other spaces to derail the treaty, that they use the same tactics, like whether it's, you know, anti-smoking, the same lawyers, the same... Uh, stealth advocates will then come to another issue and use the same strategies to upend, to create doubt. And it's something that we've seen, you know, again, this is only my second INC and you've been to, you both, uh, uh, Patty and Bethany, and I think Lisa and I were at, at two ourselves. We've seen different kinds of scientists and we've seen calls for, you know, who's the, who are the honest brokers in the room? Who are the issue advocates? Those are often NGOs with a mission. But then when we saw an in INC4 and some of that here, the INC5, were the stealth advocates, the ones that come in and, and they're just trying to create doubt, to, to, to try to derail the science and, and have people look at the science and say, okay, you really don't know enough when we actually do. I'm wondering if you saw any of that at, at INC5 when we're just coming back from, from Korea. I was just trying to find some links to put into the chat because we, uh, we myself and 30 of my closest friends published an article on this just before the third INC. Uh, and what Marcus is referring to, these tactics that are being used, uh, as as he said already, are very um, well used. They've been around for decades, the, the, the big tobacco playbook, the big oil playbook. And we see the same ones playing out in this space. So we have an, uh, an article about the, the, the kinds of tactics that you might see. And when I'm done talking, I will put it into the 
the chat or the question and answer wherever I can put it uh, about what that looks like. And there are books written on the subject, the, the purveyors, uh, the merchants of doubt, the purveyors of doubt, the smoke and mirrors, these kinds of tactics. Um, and we have definitely seen it uh, playing out. The number of lobbyists attending the meetings have has steadily increased over time. Yeah. As Patty said, some of us have been experiencing harassment and intimidation tactics. I've spoken quite publicly about that. I've gone on the record with media and I've filed reports with the UN about some of these incidences. And I, my personal experience is that the industry people that have been doing this have backed off a little bit. The kinds of things I've been experiencing have been, um, they've been questioning the more myself as a person than my research, but trying to get my research attracted from by writing to journal editors, writing uh, articles about me and their branch organizations, uh, uh, yelling, uh, like acting in intimidating manners, like in person, face to face, um, shouting, name calling, like th these sorts of things. But I think um, I think I I want to think that shining a light on it helps. I don't know that it necessarily does, but I know that not everyone can speak openly about it because because I uh, like I have a very secure employment position I live in a very safe country that has anti-slap legislation I know other people um, might lose their jobs they might be sued they might uh, lose their work employment uh, they might be deported from their countries like these kinds of things are happening to scientists around the world and it's it, it is a it's a big problem it's a very big problem it it also undermines our ability to create uh, policies that are truly effective. So if we're not basing decisions and, and basing policies on fact, then there's a, a pretty big risk that we're going to be um, writing non-solutions or creating regrettable situations that are not going to help people, not protect people and not protect the environment. So it's it's really important that we talk about these things. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's clear that um, there's so much potential for this, um, for, for these sort of tactics and doubt, because Frankly, scientists are just outnumbered. We're at INC5, we are outnumbered more than three to one industry lobbyists compared to scientists that were there on the ground. Um, and this harassment and public intimidation issue is, is real. Um, but I, I did want to come back to something Marcus said earlier that this high ambition coalition clearly is outlining hope and maybe wanted to pivot a little bit to where the science has started to make some headway into the treaty texts, the draft treaty text, um, maybe around chemicals or around products. Like where, where are some areas where you, um, where you might be hopeful? Maybe Beth, or uh, Patty, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I think that at this point, I, as, as Marcus said, um, I came back from, from INC5 with, with a sense of hope because it's actually the first time I see uh, delegates so united uh, in, in the press conference. Like I, I had like goosebumps all, all over my body and 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 also in plenary um, when all the countries came together. So I think that right now, plastic production is one of those is still on the table. Uh, the the reduction of, of, of plastic production, if we would have a treaty right now that is weak that would not be on the table. I I think that is still hope for human health text. I also think that it's um we can be hopeful for for having a better like just transition text that it doesn't really exist so much right now and they couldn't they couldn't agree on anything. So I think that there is like this window of opportunity. If there is a still like I think at some at some point the representative of Mexico said that there is like this coalition of the willing countries. Uh, I don't I don't remember exactly what were the words uh, that that Miss Camila used, but but she said like the countries of the willingness or something, and 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 they were saying that that they want a strong treaty, and to me that is also a, an open door to keep. Uh, to keep talking about these topics and science, independent science is very important on, on these issues, especially on uh, reduction of plastic production and human health, as well as uh, just transition and human rights, which I think that it's still not really uh, in the in the text. Um, that yeah. was such a powerful moment 
in the plenary when the when the lead delegate from Mexico named each country and it just went on and on and on. It was so clear that there was a lot of support and power behind it. Bethany. Yeah. Yeah, so as as you've both indicated, this was a very powerful moment and a shift in the dialogue. I really wish that this had happened two or three or four meetings ago. There seems to be a, a lot of momentum. I still, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic be, because I fear that the, the tactics that are being used by the, the like-minded country are still going to be in place. Uh, the, the delay tactics, the negotiating tactics that they've been using, and that the negotiations are are functioning under consensus right now um, for, for many reasons. And this means that they need to reach consensus. And we don't have consensus around some of the really important points that Patty just mentioned, like production reduction and chemicals of concern. There have been some shifts in in the treaty text in how these problems are being referred to. Production reduction or primary polymer production reduction has been relabeled as supply and chemicals of concern in plastics is now being addressed as chemicals of concern in products, which shifts that problem further downstream from the producers to sort of midstream manufacturers, which I, I think is problematic from an implementation perspective and would increase costs around compliance and monitoring. But that's um, that's a whole nother discussion. So I think while I, there is a lot of momentum, I really I really hope that there are tools to take that momentum and that hope and to put it into actual treaty text and, and to push back hard against the bad faith actions of the like-minded group. Yeah. It's a no small, no small feat, Marcus. So I'm, uh, I'm always thinking about what, what is the role of the scientist, you know, in, in light of, you know, we have the, the, the like-minded groups, the petrochemical countries that want to derail the whole process. And that was evident in INC5. Then this massive groundswell, this coalition that's formed, I think uh, the, the, the delegate from Mexico listed off 92 countries. And from and the uh, the delegate from Panama uh, said there were 120 a broader coalition. Um, then I think about you know the the attacks on science uh, that Patricia and and and, and Bethany mentioned. Uh, one that, that as you uh, you didn't mention Bethany was having to put screen protectors on your laptops. People walking behind you taking pictures, which is nuts, just insane. So with those kinds of attacks on science. And then you got the the stealth advocates that just want to manufacture doubt. Um, the role of the scientist, you know, from being an honest broker, just here's the science, policymakers do what you want to do with them, make your decisions, to being a little more advocating your very strong points, ethical points, uh, moralistic points about, about how plastic is used in society. There's a little bit of a shift. And it comes from, I think, being forced to take on a defensive posture against those those attacks, um, which is good. It's it's okay uh, to have that little, little bit of advocacy that comes out because you have to state your position on things. You're being attacked incessantly, and then thinking, you know, that's that's one question. The other is the role of of scientists in this process. Um, you have 120 nations that are aligned. You have the groups that don't want to derail the whole process, and then there are a bunch in the middle. And I would say the United States is included. The United States, as, as many of you may or may not know, rescinded an agreement to production caps one week prior to INC5. So yeah, so, so, so those are two questions. One is, you know, the role of a scientist, you, you can't be an honest broker because the attacks are incessant, becoming more stating your positions as an advocate. And the other is, how do we approach the ones in the middle? like the U.S. and others that aren't that 120, that aren't in the like-minded countries? Uh, okay, so the role of science here, and there's a few different layers I think we could answer this question on, but we've we've decided, uh, we've had a lot of discussions around this, that our, our efforts are best spent not feeding the trolls, if you will, and, and not um, spending a lot of time talking to countries whose 
positions we are very unlikely to shift anyway, but rather to spend our time providing providing evidence to countries that might need it to strengthen their positions or to help argue for, for strong, ambitious positions, and also to help interpret the text, which is what we were doing on the ground at INC5. Um, we didn't really talk about that very much, but we were uh, midweek shut out of the rooms and, and there was a decision made to move all of the negotiations into informal groups without observers present, which is problematic from, uh, from a democratic perspective, most definitely. But what we were doing was analyzing the texts that were coming out of those rooms. And we could give feedback from the scientific perspective saying like, this is strong, this is problematic, this there's no evidence for this, or this is a really good idea. And here's a bunch of papers supporting why. Uh, also talking about terminology and the meaning of, of um, some of the words that are being used and how they might limit the, the treaty or they might be important to implementation of the treaty from, again, from our, our broad understanding of the, the interdisciplinary science around these questions. So I think, I mean, what, what we we go into every meeting with a plan on how we're going to um how we're going to work at the meetings and then we just we throw it right out the window because things change on the ground uh, again back to being responsive and reactive um we will work in the intersessional period we will be reaching out i mean we've we've done this since uruguay had a lot of bilateral meetings with individual countries or had meetings with regional groups to try to support them with science. Sometimes they would uh, come to us with very specific questions relevant to their regions and the challenges they're facing. Sometimes it was uh, asking for feedback on their positions. Sometimes it was um, just, just a general conversation around the science. So we, we've been doing a lot of that work and we'll continue to do it. Um, regarding the, the democratic processes here and the misinformation, the, the bad actors, the lobbyists the, that are seeking to undermine these processes. This is, this is something that is being addressed. And yes, we're on the defensive, but we're also on the offensive. I know a lot of CSOs are raising this issue. There have been a number of articles written, uh, letters written to, there's an open letter to uh, written to Antonio Guterres around concerns around corporate capture of UNEP. UNEP has um, opened up this process to a multi-stakeholder process, as they're referring to it, We're bringing all of these different actors into the room, like anyone that sort of has an interest in um, in plastics throughout its life cycle. And that means that you're putting into the same space the people that are, are profiting from plastics and chemicals and production. So there are definite economic interest there, but they're also the same uh, industries, companies, individuals, people that are the purveyors of harm. So they're perpetuating harm amongst individuals that are in the same room. So in the same room, you'll have frontline and fence line communities, indigenous peoples from small island states, women, children, workers, uh, waste pickers who are suffering the harm of this production of these chemicals. And they're meant to be sharing the space with the people that are, are perpetuating this harm. And it creates uh, power imbalances and injustices in, in the process that are also problematic. And again, this is something that is being highlighted, that is being written about, that is being um, maybe not addressed, but but uh, uh, having a light sh shine on it. Mm -hmm. And even though as scientists, we sometimes do have that target on our backs, the science demonstrating that harm from plastics is quite clear. So the evidence is certainly on it's uh, indisputable in many cases in some cases it's it's a bit more emerging but in some cases it's indisputable and so we we hear you know all the time we we do need more science but would you all agree that we know enough enough to act if 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 i may i think that Yes. Like who could like I'm sorry, but at this point, who could think that we don't? Um uh, we we do have it. And I think that um every day I, sometimes it's very it's very hard to cut to to be on top of everything that is being around uh, reading about plastics. I remember a few years ago, it would be when I was doing I started researching about plastics 10 years ago and I remember like I could almost pinpoint every document and contact people now it's impossible there are like dozens of of papers going out if not every day every second day 
And most of them are, are like the results is that plastics are, have an, uh, a negative impact either on the environment or on people. I think that the most, um, some of the, of the things that we have to be alert when, when we have missed and disinformation and people try to sell as the idea that plastics are not, um, toxic, not all of them, but like, um, uh, but more like that there are like plastic is, is good and is inert. That's something that we heard a lot that plastic is inert, that doesn't have any, any, uh, pervasiveness towards uh, us or the environment. Um, I would say that it's, um, we have to look into what are the research, like the questions they're asking, because sometimes the questions that they are purposing, uh, like making in purpose are so, they already know the yes or no. So when we reach, when we read research or from coming from the industry, it's very important to be critical on what is the research question. Uh, because yes, maybe for a specific thing, plastics are very good, but it's for that specific thing. It doesn't take into account toxicity or the full life cycle or like from when, and when we say full life cycle is from extraction and production of, of, of a raw material like fossil fuels until once plastic is microplastic already having an interaction on earth system processes. That's the work that Bethany, um, Marcus and I have been doing with the planetary boundaries. Um, so I just think that as people working on these spaces and being interested about these spaces, uh, like be critical of what this research or that idea that someone is trying to sell you, like how that research question is framed, because that would give you already uh, uh, potentially a, a very specific answer. Bethany, and then um, I'd love to move to some questions because we're we're starting to see some come in already. But um, Bethany, I'll, I'll I'll I see you. Okay, raised. just uh, quickly uh, agreeing with Patty on a lot of what she said that we do. <clears throat> there is a lot of science out there, and we definitely have enough to act. But we will need more science in the future. So the science around human health impacts is emerging, and as we shift into a future that is safer and more sustainable, we're going to have to to study the changes that we're making and make sure that they are the best changes, that we're not working with regrettable substitutions. We're gonna see shifts in the kinds of materials that we're using, the kinds of products that we're using, maybe the systems and infrastructures that are material agnostic, that don't use materials, and making sure that the changes that we're, we're making are, are truly more sustainable than what we're doing now. So I think we, know, we definitely know enough to act, we know enough to, to stop doing some of the bad things, and we just, there, there will be opportunities for more science uh, moving forward into the future as new questions arise, I think. So we don't have all the science. We don't have, we never have all the answers, but we have definitely enough to act. We're seeing that human health science really accelerating. Even just since being back from Korea, I've seen several new papers published and there's probably many more that I haven't haven't seen. Um, to focus a little bit on um, that regrettable substitutions and safer products, you know, what are those essential uses? Um, we're seeing some questions come in from the audience. Um, I'd also love Paulita just to come on camera to help field any any questions if they're policy related. Um, so if you haven't already, feel free to drop some questions in the chat. But when, um, when someone asked a question about um, how delegates are thinking about um, formulations and chemical transparency. So like how to, how to target um, restrictions on specific polymer families and or specific classes of plastic related chemicals. Okay, so um, there's a, a few questions wrapped up into that question. But I think right now where the where the conversation is and where the treaty is, is around a very small number of chemicals of concern and problematic and avoidable products. And um, what the conversations are right now around initial listings of, of chemicals and products. And what needs to be done carefully is uh, understanding which criteria and standards would be used to list which chemicals or products. And this is again, where science can feed in. And it's also important that there is a mechanism in the treaty so that it can be updated as new science emerges, because as I said, we will be learning new things in the future. And we might 
we might need to expand those lists. We might need to change the, the decisions that have been made. And these, uh, these should be based again in science and they should be, um, they should be uh, reactive to, to new science. So there will need to be some sort of mechanism for what you might call it a science policy interface, um, a, a science and technical expert group. But there's a lot of different words that are being thrown around for this, this body thing, organization panel that will exist in the future treaty. But in, important that it, there are uh, mechanisms for including independent scientists, but also for mitigating conflicts of interest, which I think will definitely be an issue uh, going forward as well. So uh, criteria and standards on listing chemicals of concern, but the fact that initial lists are being discussed, I see as, as positive because that means that there'll be room for potentially expanding them going forward. Uh, so far, polymers have not been listed because the conversation has been shifted to products, which is midstream. Uh, vinyl chloride was lifted in, in one of the conference room papers. So uh, that would put uh, PVC on, on the, the short list. Um, regarding the question around transparency and reporting, that's a hard one. There's not a lot of support for that, obviously, from uh, industry. It's um, it's a question that is very important, that is being lifted by scientists and by a number of CSOs. But it's a difficult conversation being had in the room because of the vested interest, because of the massive numbers of chemicals and polymers that we're talking about, 16,000 chemicals that are used in plastics products. And shifting the conversation to products puts that midstream which would strengthen the call for transparency and reporting because a lot of manufacturers midstream are not going to know what's in their products and they won't have that information unless it's transparently reported through the life cycle. So it's, I'm not sure if that's been fully understood by a lot of the delegates that are negotiating at this point. I think that's definitely a point that we can try to lift and make more clear in our conversations with delegates. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. It's a, mm -hmm. That one's a heavy lift. I totally think it's a good idea, but it's a hard one. We have another question here about alternative materials and any updates on how they'll be addressed, um, if at all, in the treaty text, um, or have the ideas of around alternative materials, have they mostly um, been happening on the sides? I think how, how alternate materials get addressed in the text, I think maybe uh, Bethany and Patty might uh, have some insights. Um, but I, I want to make one point on that. I, I see that Tim Silman posed that question about innovation and in novel materials. And it, it made me think of, you know, one quote from the, the delegate from Panama when he said, uh, we don't want a waste management treaty. Like that's, that's one of the big differences between, you know, the petrochemical companies uh, countries and the companies, they really want to focus on let's just clean up and recycle. They want to kick the can downstream. And that, I mean, clean up, focusing on that and recycling is not going to address the harm along the way. All the harm on the front end, all the raw material uh, uh, that gets extracted, all the, lo the, the loss of chemicals along the way, um, and then all the impact waste has until it until you get to some point of recycling and cleanup, which is so inefficient anyway. The rest of the world wants this front end, uh, sort of uh, looking at mitigations way on the front end. So innovative materials is one of many kinds of innovation, the reuse, refill, remanufacture technologies, those business models. There's so much evidence of those that work and mitigate the harm before the harm even happens. So in terms of the, the biopolymers, there's a lot of innovation in that space. In that space, right before I came to INC, I was at a conference in DC on uh, on innovations in in chemicals and materials, and there's a lot of talk, you know, about the efficacy of of, of biopolymers. But like Patty said, it's very specific. You know, we're addressing specific products for a specific use, and this is where Lisa, I wanted to, you know, talk about uh, a paper that you authored. On, on sectors that we're gonna solve the problem, you know, each of these sectors of use has a very different sort of upstream mitigation plan. I wonder if maybe you might wanna comment on, on that because it was a very powerful paper that you authored on that sort of sector approach to an upstream uh, solution. Well, they all they also have so many different polymers, entry points to the environment. And, you know, we're, we're seeing maybe it's a, it's a 
it's a useful um, framing as we move to products because it, products are used in lots of different sectors. Um, and a medical use will require different types of regulation, different types of essential use compared to single use food packaging. So, um, we, you know, we've seen some discussions on that sort of framing already, which is exciting um, and, and probably, probably necessary as we really start to chip away at those essential uses and where we should see specific product bans. Bethany, did you have? Yeah, I just wanted to like what Marcus was saying about waste and recycling, I think is a really important issue. So thank you for raising that. And I think if we if we work upstream at production and design, then we can definitely make waste management better. Waste management does need to be included because it is very important for especially for a lot of countries that don't currently have functioning um, waste management infrastructure or existing legacy plastics pollution that are, are still a problem in, in many places in the world. Mm, but it, uh, when it comes to old, new or alternative materials, I think first off that sometimes we don't we don't have to replace things with new things. We can just shift away from extraction and production into systems that are not using materials. But then when we are replacing, the, the, we have to make sure that the the replacements are being assessed via the same criteria as anything else in terms of um, uh, safety and sustainability, and that. Um, we should be doing this pre-market that there has to be some some sort of like pre-market screening for all of these products and again these criteria need to be established um and, and science-based and evidence-based i'm gonna mute myself and i just want to let everyone know that i need to jump off the call very soon so i'll say um thank you and goodbye i'll stay on for another minute but just wanted to say that while i had the mic thank you bethany alida hi yes um, I just wanted to add from a policy perspective, if we're, when we're working on international laws, it's incredibly important to think actually about the waste and the recycling end of things, um, building off of what Bethany said. I represent both a developing nation, I'm a Belizean American, so I do a lot of my work in the Caribbean, as well as the United States. And so we're um, in the Belize, we're often the recipient of a lot of the products that are made by countries like the United States, right? So when we think about international policies, we have to think comprehensively about how we help the nations that maybe do not have the infrastructure in place already um, to, to take care of these plastics, right? I mean, no one really has that infrastructure in place actually, but in developing countries like the Caribbean, we're definitely seeing a lot of issues there. And we're just starting to get to the point where we're learning more about the production side and those impacts and the connections to climate and public health. So it's important to think to definitely look at policy comprehensively so that it's equitable to all nations. Thanks, Paulina. And we're, we're coming up on time. So I just, there's so many questions and we won't be able to address them all, but a lot of questions about, um, you know, what would seal the deal in terms of public perception and how to stay abreast of new developments in research. This is a challenge for individuals. It's a challenge for delegates. Um, so I would I would say follow along for what the Scientists Coalition is publishing in terms of fact sheets and policy briefs. It's often very current, um, sort of up to the minute information on some of the latest science and as well in five jars, we try to uh, point to some of the some of the best available science as well. Um, so with that, you know we're at we're at time, and I would just love to say thank you, Bethany, thank you, Patty, thank you, Marcus, for joining in this conversation. We could go on for many hours, but um, get back to the important work that you're all doing. Thank you very much.